thank you for coming. And uh, it is my mission that you leave this webinar with a plan moving forward. Um, this is for the benefit of parents, teachers, and students. So I do hope that there are some students there. Before we go much further in this, there is one activity. It just takes a few minutes, but if you can just grab a piece of paper and a pencil, or even the back of the slide deck, if you um, printed it out, will be fine. It doesn't have to be a big area, but it's something, just a piece of paper will be fine. Um, and it'll, you have a few minutes before we start that. This, as Beth had indicated, is a, the third in a series of executive function study skill strategies. And this one is focused primarily on um, studying for a test. But you will find that this, there's other things that will be part of it because none of these things are done in an isolation. So let's go over what we're gonna actually get, um, learn in this session. First, how does learning, memory, and retention affect studying for a test? The eight fundamentals for studying, which are gonna sound a little similar if you attended the processing, and I'm gonna have a link for that as well. Effective study strategies. So each of these fundamentals will have strategies that can be related to them. Then how do you write a study plan? Because one of the problems is that students start from scratch every time they take a new te a test, when if once a study plan works, just follow that same study plan. Reading directions, this may not seem like it would fit under studying for a test, but you will see how reading directions during the test is really um, quite appropriate for this kind of a webinar. Taking the test itself, once you've prepared for it, making sure that you use the best strategies to take the test. So what we wanna do is look at, this is an example of how a student without the strategies might go ahead and approach studying for a test. They take a paper that they have read, maybe a PDF, an article in a, um, a workbook or something, they highlight what is felt to be appropriate, and then they study by simply reading Maya Angelou, the grandmother was Anna Henderson, she was a proprietor, and simply rereading the yellow and say, okay, I've studied for the test. So what we wanna do instead of rereading it is write flashcards, asking questions about such as what experiences form Maya's character of strength, or record a podcast telling of Maya's experiences. So we want to move from the basic rereading of highlighting to actively engaging and studying the information. So let's look at the fundamentals that are related to this. This is an overview, and we're gonna go through each fundamental in detail. Number one, it is crucial to study in short sessions instead of one long session. In terms of memory retention, after about 20 or 30 minutes, your brain needs a break. And you're not gonna be able to retain any other additional information. You need to organize all your study materials, not according to the format, like all my notes and then all my textbook and then all my worksheets, but according to content. We're gonna go over that. Whoops. Using metacognition to determine a study plan. In other words, understanding what do I need to know? What don't I need to know? Creating the study plan. What am I gonna do for each of the four nights that I'm gonna study for this test? Focus on one task at a time when studying, and we're gonna find out how to get rid of some of those distractors while studying. Using multiple methods. Don't just use flashcards over and over and over. You're gonna use flashcards, retake the teacher quizzes, 
make a summary chart, draw conclusions, study different information each session, and avoiding starting on the, on the first page of the notes every single time that you study. And study for memorization and summarizing and making inferences, and especially for high school students doing analysis. We want to avoid our, this is what most students always study for, is the pure memorization. So let's look at each one of these fundamentals in detail and related strategies that support these fundamentals. The first one, study in multiple short sessions instead of one long session. Essentially, this begins way back in day one, the first day that new information is presented in the unit, where you spend 10 or 15 minutes reviewing the information that you were given so that your memory doesn't, of that information doesn't dip down past 80%. So when it comes time to doing intense study for the test, you've already done small incremental study sessions to be able to retain the memory. So you're not starting out way back down at 20% of retention. Now this is a slide and um, this slide and the next slide are kind of a review from the last webinar of eight um, strat of the eight strategies to process information. There is, and it will be put in the chat, a link to this webinar. So if you were not able to attend the last one or you want to review it again, you're welcome to do so with the link that's in the chat or go to hillcenter.org under community ed series and you will be able to find the video for that webinar as well. But these are some of the things that we went over last time, summarizing conclusions, reviewing with online videos, making flashcards, recording a podcast, creating a teaching tool such as a PowerPoint, connecting notes, discussing information with a study buddy. This is gonna be something we're gonna talk about a lot tonight, developing a reference tool. If you'll notice, each one of these are a, is a, action that we want the students to engage with the information instead of just reread the information. And when we during the last webinar, I gave all the benefits for doing those eight strategies at the time you get the information. And it was a little bit of a hard sell, I'm certain at the time, but I then promised at the end to all students that if you do this, you actually save time when studying for a test because you're doing the processing as you go along. And then you, what you have retained is a higher level. So studying is not as difficult. So this will be where the proof is in the pudding of that statement that I gave the last the webinar. So one of the things that we're gonna go ahead and look at, because we do want shorter sessions of studying, if we indicated that each one of these sessions, history, science, and English are 20 minutes, that's an hour's worth of studying for Monday, compared to an hour's worth of studying for just history on Monday. So let's say that we have a test on Friday in history, and what we have is um, English has a test on Thursday. So if we break this up so that history, take a day off for history, history is 20 minutes, history is 20 minutes. We have spread it out over a period of time. It's referred to as the interleaved schedule and it is taking breaks, giving your brain a break from the information, studying something else, coming back to the information, studying something else, coming back to the information is far more effective in the long-term memory than doing block studying, which is only good for short-term memory. So if we have a quiz on Tuesday and we're just real quickly studying 
for a short period of time on Monday for Tuesday. I might remember it for Tuesday, but I will have to re-study it for the test that comes down either for the quarter or the semester. Fundamental number two is to organize all study material. You wanna collect it according to the topic instead of the format. So if we are studying about uh, a period in history, we wanna take that period of history from the textbook, collect it with the same period of history in the notes, look at the worksheets that came from that exact same period and any articles. So you wanna collect and put together information that is like topic, not like format. So instead of just reading all your notes from beginning to end, then looking at the textbook from beginning to end, then looking at the worksheets from beginning to end, combined your notes your worksheets, your readings, and the text about the same topic. Here's an example of what one student has done, and it was quite successful. And so looked at her um, notes that she took, and this is about sedentary rock formations, and that has been earmarked with the blue sticky note. And the pages in her textbook that are, have the exact same content are also in the blue. Likewise, the orange is like, like, like type content and the yellow is like type content. And so when looking at the blue notes, also having the same exact kind of information in the textbook open at the same time. Likewise, for any worksheets, for quizzes, for any PDFs or any other content. Looking at fundamental number three, using metacognition to determine a study plan. Having the student learn, what will this test be about? What can I just decipher? Do I have a study guide? Don't I have a study guide? What, what could I use? What do I know? What do I need to learn? What do I need to study versus review? What do I choose to study? Should I use a partner? Will that discussion help? What is better that I study on my own? What materials do I use to study? What do I have? And this is where do I have a study plan from the teacher? Um, and what processing strategy supported prior learning? How do I best learn and how do I know what to memorize versus to understand versus to analyze? So students, I would highly recommend that you attend stu teacher study sessions. Even if this is a, a class that is you're quite skilled at, not only are you getting more information about that content, but you actually learn how to attend a study guide, how to, I mean, a study session how to take notes during those study sessions, what kind of questions to ask a teacher. So the more you get engaged in studies, teacher study sessions, the more you get, know how to use them. Use the, stu the study guide as a primary source. I have a number of students that I've worked with that they'll eventually, they'll say, well, I have a study guide, and they just saw it as another piece of paper to study, versus the primary sheet. If one is not provided by the teacher, and sometimes in high school especially, it isn't provided, create your own. This is actually a form of metacognition. What do I predict will be on the test? I'm gonna write my own study guide. I'll share it with the teacher and get advice from the teacher. So not only do you get an, an advice and input from the teacher, but actually writing the study guide is a method of studying. Compile all the quizzes and tests related to the topic. I can tell, the, I tell the students all the time, if a teacher put it on a quiz or a test, they've already identified that it is of importance to them. And so use them 
as a primary study source. And equally, compile all assignments, your notes and documents about the topic so that you can, as you compile them, categorize them, put them in piles of different topics and subtopics. Um, I even had one student who would use the dining room table and start, she was doing a study on the Civil War and started at the very beginning at Fort Sumter and that was where she sat for dinner and then put a pile of all the battles along the way until Gettysburg, until the end, until Appomattox and was able to visually and walk around the table and kind of get a gestalt, a big picture of the sequence of all these things. Make a list of what I know and what I don't know. What do I have to ask the teacher about? Understand that if there's something in the study guide you're not real comfortable with, or that you have something in your test or that you didn't get a correct answer in, make sure you have all of those correct pieces of information. And then write a study plan. And that's the segue for the next fundamental, which is actually create a study plan. Now this is something that takes that you start with and each time you take the same kind of a test, you use it and you modify it if needed. So here's an example of a student who wrote a vocabulary test plan. They were pretty routine about every two or three weeks and got made a list of all the things that made it quite helpful, listened to Quizlet notes on day one and played two Quizlet games. So that's what my plan was for day one. And she did that every time she had a test on day one. On day two, read the sentences that were in the workbook with each vocabulary and made associations with the word in context. So that she kind of said, well, instead of reading the word, I'll read the definition so I can put the two together. And she would take a self-made test in Quizlet until she got a 90%. That's what she did for day two. When she was done, she was done. Day three, day four, and day five. Doing this study plan, was, it was pretty predictable that every single time she took a vocabulary test, she would get anything between a 94 and a 98. It worked, be consistent with it, and repeat it. Keep a list of the ones that are effective. Here's an example of one. This was for the history test, and it was a um, pretty large test. And if you'll notice, day one was organize all the worksheets. Once again, this is not wasted time. This is studying time. Put them according to topic. What are the main topics and subtopics that I'll probably need to know for this test? went through and made, and we're gonna hold off on the red for the moment. I'm gonna come back to that in just a second, but practice the facts in Quizlet that she had put in, review class assignments. She then practiced facts again, and these were actually about different subtopics. That wasn't written in here, but every time she had a different subtopic, she'd have a different Quizlet set. And one of the things that she, was, she needed was, to review all teacher notes in, in, in sequence. And so then she would, oh, this, that's what this one was, from beginning to end. So she got a sense of the sequence of these events in history class. So prior to doing the study plan, she was actually not doing well and would get a D with some read credits for corrections and knew that she could do much better came up with the first study plan minus the comments in red. She took the next test and this time got a 74, which was a huge improvement. We reviewed the test. We went over exactly what questions she got right, what questions she had difficulty with. And each time we looked at a question that she did not get correct, her first comment was, I meant to ask the teacher. I meant to ask the teacher before the test and I forgot. Therefore, that task was put in her study plan. After that was put in there, she remembered to contact the teacher, got the information, 
was able to review it appropriately, and all of her tests after that were 85 or above. So you keep a plan like that and you repeat it and repeat it. Fundamental number five, focus on a singular test when, a task, excuse me, when studying. And this is where we are. I am gonna just go ahead and hold this slide here for just a second. If you are have just arrived um, and you wanna grab a real, quickly get grab just a piece of paper and a pencil, we're gonna do an activity that will let you see what it's like when students are trying to do more than one thing at a time, study more than one thing at a time, um, have too much material around them. So if you will, I'm gonna give you, when, it, when it's, I start the time, I'm gonna give you a minute to do two very simple tasks. The first task is to write a sentence. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. A very simple task. Come down one line and write the numbers from one to 28 and, and fill in, in the numbers here. So this would be 17, 18, 19 to 28. And I will give you one minute in order to do this. And it'll seem quite simple and many will wonder, well, what in the world is this about? But you will see, I promise. And so your minute begins right now. And your time is up. My alarm was pretty. Um, there, okay. Okay. And if you're like any of the other participants at any of my workshops, I've done this so many times, that was no problem. You quickly and easily wrote the sentence, wrote all of the numbers probably with time to spare, and a minute seemed like a very lengthy time. This time, however, what you're gonna do is the exact same task, but differently. You are first going to write the T in today, then the nut come down and do the number one. Go back up to the sentence, write the O, come down to the numbers, write the two, and continue with the D, three, a four y five doing both of them at the exact same time and having it done within the, the exact same minute and so you may now begin And indeed, your time is up. If you are like any of those that have been at the workshop and done it, and you, 
If you have finished, congratulations, you are would be a first. For most have maybe gotten halfway through and indeed discovered that not only did you get nothing accomplished, but you did the process. You probably aren't even focused on what this sentence is or what you're doing with the numbers. And indeed, that's what students feel like. And students, if you're trying to do your homework and do the stuff on social media or do your homework and also get with a friend about what you're doing, what is doing history, doing two things at one time is just not productive. So you wanna singularly focus on it. So wanna go ahead and give out some strategies for some students on doing this. Clear your desk of all materials not needed for the task. So if you have your history book and your science notes and your calculator sitting in the middle and all of this, clear everything. And if you're studying for history, only have your history notes, your history book, your history quizzes, your history notebook out at that time. Look at your plan and know exactly what you plan to do. Back there where we had our day one, day two, what exactly are you gonna do at that time? Singularly focus on what that plan is that you expect to get accomplished during that period. Set the timer to, for your study time and just stay off of media. And you can even put set some of your media on do not disturb, do so. Know what you plan to accomplish so you know when you're finished. So if you said that you're gonna study and practice Quizlet, you know, a Quizlet test until you get 90%, you know when you have accomplished what you expect to get done. Use a sticky note strategy for thoughts you must remember later. And that, this, that's what's gonna be in the next slide. And a student approached me, and I love it when students approach me, with the concept of, I need to solve a problem. This is legitimate. And she said, you're right. I was on media too much, but there's sometimes I think of something that I have to do. I'm studying for history. And I had to ask my science teacher about a project. I know I'm not supposed to stop and do that right now, but I know if I don't do it right now, I will forget how do we solve this problem? And after about two days of discussion and playing around with some ideas and seeing what worked and what didn't, she came up with the idea of putting a sticky note on the corner of her desk, just at one empty sticky note. And then when she thought of something that was important, not a text to a friend, but an email to the science teacher, she would just put the, a note right there on the sticky note so she wasn't fearful that she would forget to do it later on. She could stop worrying about that email she had to send to the science teacher and maintain her focus to the, on the history study. Fundamental number six, use multiple methods to study. And this is one of the things that students get into kind of a rut with is they will always study just their Quizlet list. And they'll study it over and over, but you haven't used your different senses, visual, auditory, movement, doing an action with it. Actively study with action, write an answer, pretend you have a question, what would your answer be? Speak a response out loud. It is amazing when you think it, when you hear it, when you speak it, when if you dictate it, then you hear it back. All that is so powerful other than just reading those yellow highlighted. Match index cards up. Play concentration with those index cards. Make a test for a trusted friend. Switch tests. Take your own test the next night. Take you and your, your friends switch tests. Get different perspectives of what might, what is expected to be on that test. Orally state your notes in your own words. Pretend you're teaching. So as you're looking at your notes, instead of just reading what's highlighted, step back, look at your topic, 
uh, kind of pretend that you're speaking to a class and state your notes in your own words as if you're speaking them to a class. Use notes to recall related details. And I have an example of that. This is a student's work. And essentially, these are the notes with the main ideas. This was about the Fahrenheit 451 and the detailed notes related to it. And essentially what the student did was to take a piece of paper, cover up the notes, and on the first, then would go ahead and say what the main idea is and can he recite and remember what is under this paper. Now, I wouldn't recommend, as we talked in one of the fundamentals, don't always start with number one, do number two, number three. By the time you get to number 12, that will not have been practiced as much. And so I would say, do the top one of each page on one night, or do this note set of notes one night, the next page another night. Don't always start with number one. Also, not only do you ask, I, this is the main idea, what are the details, but I would also highly recommend, if these are the details, what is the topic that this is about? What is the topic that this is about? So not only do you not wanna start with number one every day and say, these are the three things, these are the four things related to this topic, you wanna start at different places in your notes at different nights. And sometimes you wanna identify the topic and sometimes you wanna identify the detail. This is a way to review previous tests and quizzes. Remember, if it was presented once on a test, that means it's important for a quiz. So this is the original test. This is an actual student test. Put it in. This is a, a made a copy of the test, put the copy, white it out the answers and put it in a protective sleeve, took a dry erase marker and retook the test and your original test becomes the answer key. Once again, the reason for this is because if it was on a quiz, if it was on a weekly test or a check, that means the teacher has already identified it. It's a metacognition. These are the ones that you know. You can do this with worksheets. This is difficult with essays or long answers because there's so much involved in them and you're not expected to repeat them word for word. This is an effective way to, once again, we wanna be active with our learning. We don't wanna just start at the beginning. So you have your, if you have flashcards, you have four piles of flashcards and you're gonna go ahead and identify one as one I know immediately, information that I thought, info I know with thought, but I have to think about it and information I really don't know and information that I don't know because I don't understand and I need to ask the teacher. So you have your pile of your flashcards, and if it's immediate, you put it down there. These flashcards, you're only gonna practice like once every four times or once a night. So you look at it, once I've decided, I've gone through my stack of flashcards, then I take this, oh wait, I'm sorry, I take this information and I either email the teacher or schedule a time to meet with the teacher, or get with a, a study buddy. This is one, the pile that you actually have to take action beyond memorizing or studying. I then pick up this pile and I then, if I know it with thought this time, I move it to the, the pile next to it. If I know it immediately, I move it all the way up. And so you keep moving these flashcards and you study more the flashcards that are further to the right than the flashcards that are to the left. If you get to this point and one of these flashcards becomes unfamiliar again, just simply move it back to a previous set. 
This way you don't keep studying what you know over and over. Studying with the peer group is phenomenal. It's, they, it's ubiquitous in colleges. High schools are starting to use this more and more. And I would even recommend starting to use study groups as young as third or fourth grade. And I'll give you the parameters of them. And teachers can help that in classes. And we're going to go through all this. But it's a group of, for this is specifically, this specific group is high school students of but any group can be two to six students preparing for the same test that have a commitment to prepare for a study session. For high school students, I've had groups of high school students that actually sign a commitment paper that for an hour and a half, they're committed to stay on task and won't talk about their soccer game or anything else. And they had each member equally has to participate and be accountable to each other to do so. Advantages are that students have increased accountability compared to studying it individually. You can't get away without studying. Oral discussion allows them to hear and to see study information. You get information from six different students who might have worded their notes a little differently, and that might have been a key difference in the success in the test. And it huge avoids the procrastination that's a huge benefit for this so we're going to look at how does it look like between third grade and 12th grade third to sixth grade maybe just two students it is definitely adult directed this is where in the classroom teacher you might just have peers with flashcards one asking the other that is the beginning of a peer study group a parent you might invite a student over to your house and say, I want the two, the two of you are going to help each other study. I'm going to watch and help you and have, answer any questions for you. During at sixth grade, you might have the parent there, but still ask the student, what can you study next? What can you read over? Which notes might you want to talk about together? So there has to be parent supervision. Teachers, I would even have some time in class to teaching the students, especially the fifth and sixth graders, how to do this. The seventh and eighth graders, you might be able to increase it. They can be supervised to make sure they stay focused, provide them with a snack, but encourage them to use, this is where you want them to use the study guides. Talk about the study guide, use the study guide, Talk about what you've indicated on there. Is there anything different that I need to add on there? And then ninth to 12th graders can start doing it more independently and designating who's gonna help bring in information about different topics. Stud peer studies are, is, are fabulously effective. Uh, fundamental seven, study different information in each session, avoiding, and we've already talked about this, avoid starting from the beginning each time and that's where your study plan helps prevent that so for example we have these four these five lovely ladies with their names on there and often what will happen is a student will say okay amber hillary dawn go down the line to jasmine study again amber hillary dawn down to jazz and keep doing it in the same order and essentially really just memorizing they only recognize the answer with the visual clue a visual cue that's what you get when you do multiple choice questions or matching or fill in the blank with the word bank that would work but if you have to do short answer questions or fill in the blank without a word bank or an essay that method is completely unproductive. And so essentially, when you get the test, this is what you're hoping for, that it'll be in the same order with the names available. So you recognize it, but you really don't know the answer. In this one, if you'll notice, it's in the same order, but you're not given a word bank. So at least you're recalling it, 
but you've only memorized them because you're really dependent on that order. And it's this, the person who can fill this in is the one who can recall it and understand. So when you can switch up the order, you don't have a word bank, that's when you understand the information. Fundamental number eight is to study for different kinds of questions, for memorization, for summary, for inferring information, for analysis, um, especially for the high school, that's the analysis. This is an activity that I do, I do with my students, my reading students, and indeed, Teachers, this is something that you could easily set up. It's just simply four different cups that I got that happen to be sitting around. And we summarize what is the use for these vessels. And actually, some of the kids will even go into, well, that's the one that they hold paper clips in, or you could use for pencils. Absolutely, summarize the use for them evaluate the benefit of using the ceramic over the others. Hmm. Infer why I would give a young child the small paper cup. Compare. So even though these are very simple things and they're literally four that I just picked up that were sitting in my room, you can still practice what each kind of question would, what kind of an answer you would get. Students need that practice. And then they can understand how they would study for each kind of question because it will be different kind of an answer. And if you'll see here with one of these study plans, indeed, some of them practice memorization, reading the sentences was analysis and recall, Quizzing a friend was inference and recall. So your plan actually includes all of these different kinds of questions that you might want to study for. Always have self-reflection as part of a test. Teachers, you can include this in a test, or parents, you can help your child after a test when they bring it in. Um, Include self-reflection as the last component of a test teachers to have students identify what they feel they did well before they received the grade and what challenged them. And you can even give them points for this self-reflection. I feel I did really well on the matching, but I admit that the short answer without word banks was difficult. Or include a self-reflection after the test is graded and returned and have the students reflect on the accuracy. What did they do well? What did they have to do differently? Do they have to change their study plan in order to accommodate for what they want to do better on next time? For younger students, consider a series of emojis to circle. And for all older students, provide guidelines for leading questions, consider adding points on reflections, and that's what I talked about up here. But I, I, I include that in my test, or I have students do it after their test and they set a goal for the next test. And I really um, don't encourage grade goals. That I would encourage goals such as I need to practice the information out of order instead of from beginning to end. So the bottom line with studying for a test is it takes time, but do it in segmented times. It takes effort, but do it with active effort. And there's nothing that can replace that active studying and there, they are effective ways. So you can take less time because it's effective time, but it does take time. One of the things is in doing all my reading, I wanted to share some of the reasons that we have. it has been documented that there has been poor test performance. Students, be real mindful of this, fail to make up miss work because you're failing to take advantage of that practice getting feedback from the teachers from that missed work. Failed to complete work along the same lines. Did not understand or follow the test directions, and that's what, why I've included that topic in this webinar. 
studied the wrong material, didn't go through the metacognition, didn't use the teacher study guide, didn't go to his teacher study session, didn't come up with his study guide themselves and ask the teacher about it, did not review material daily and waited too long to study for the test, doing that last minute three hour memorization session, which you're really not studying for that long because your brain can't. And this unpreparedness leads to test anxiety. This is not clinical anxiety, but test anxiety, even when none usually exists. And then you actually, because of that heightened anxiety, get problems incorrect that you would normally get correct because you start second guessing yourself. So let's look at those written directions because they do become quite important in this and it does affect the students, 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 read them once from beginning to end and then read each step of the directions. We're gonna talk about coding them in the next slide, but look at each set, each step, being sure to understand every single thing that's expected. Read it orally to yourself doing some vocalizations, and also crucially, crucially important, reread the directions after finishing the work. And I'm gonna demonstrate why in a minute. So this is a paragraph of a student who I had worked with. Um, it was the response to an essay question, the United States of America's government consists of three branches, legislative branch, executive branch, and judicial branch. Americans elect the president and members of their legislative branch, but do not elect judges. The legislative branch writes and votes on bills, the executive branch signs bills into law, and the judicial branch decides if the law is legal. Well written, a topic sentence, each sentence gives a different detail. Well done, well done. Uh-oh, got a 75% because when you look at the test prompt, Identify the three branches of, gum, of government. Yes, bingo, got it. And the number of members for each branch. Instead, she gave who voted, how were they appointed, and did not follow the test directions. And essentially what happened was, and if you'll ignore these numbers for just one second, this is what she did with her directions. And it was too yellow. And it was very unclear the three different ways, the three different tasks that were needed. And so what she did is started coloring coding the different tasks that were needed. So she knows she needs to do the yellow task, this teal task, and the purple pink task. And then she, after reading it, made sure the yellow was there, the teal was there, and the purple pink was there. For other students who don't have, aren't as color um, mindfulness, numbered them and underlined just the keyword. I have to identify branches. I have to figure out a number and I have to give an example. Another way that you can do that on this online environment is to take typed directions and turn them into bullet points. So it's at least easier. It's not color coded, but you can still see there's three and it's easier to see, to separate the three different tasks that are needed in that question. So we talked about coming up with the study calendar. Let's go ahead and do a learn how to do a study calendar for those big tests. We did the short test. Let's do it for the big test. Week one, you're going to organize all of your information and ask your teachers all of your necessary questions. Go to the study sessions, get the study guides, whatever you need. Week two and three will be rotating interleaving and we'll be breaking it apart and not just studying exclusively one test for a long period of time. So the first task you're gonna to do to do this is to rank your classes from the hardest to the easiest. So for this student, 
History was the hardest. There was no test in photography and geometry was the easiest. And so looking at this ranking, got a calendar and the first week organized one each night had a different um, kind of class to organize for. Then went through history, Spanish, English, biology, geometry, history, just went through and went down the list and two per, and each one of them is just a 30 minute session and making sure that you allow for free time. Then, so that goes all the way through till the test, and these are the test days. Then what you do, that we're not done yet, for these, the history was harder and geometry is easier. So we're gonna go ahead and substitute one of the geometries for the history because we want an extra session. I'm not gonna make this session longer. I'm gonna create an extra session for history because it's not needed as much for geometry. And likewise, I'm gonna substitute a Spanish for biology. And that's exactly what I did here. Oh, I did Spanish and history. And the reason I did that was because I don't want to, I, would, I don't want to increase my history load on this one. So essentially you wind up with two more sessions of your hardest ones and two less sessions for your easier ones. So the key points to remember from all of this, and then we are gonna go into tricks for taking a test, schedule an order of ranked classes, protect some free time, be sure students get that free time. Study for two sessions on most evenings, but interleave in 30 minutes, 45 minutes. For each of the two classes to be studied, um, 30 to 45 minutes, if you're going ahead for especially APs, you'll have to hike it up a little bit, but for without that, don't go past that time. On nights before a specific exam, just review just that one, but once again, no more than that 30 or 45 minutes. So wanting to go ahead, since we've talked so much about studying, let's make sure that we take the test the smartest way so that we don't go ahead and take uh, get things wrong unnecessarily. During the test, listen to what the teacher says, because often the teacher will give some last minute oral directions. And I've even had students that the teacher would announce that says, um, look at the essays, it wasn't written on there. You don't have to write answers to both of the essays, just choose one of them. And she answered both of them and only answered half of both of them because she was running out of time. So making sure that there's, that you get the oral directions. A brain dump. Once you get it and you look at the, page, at the test and before you, you're afraid you're gonna forget something, you know you have something in your mind, you notice in the essay that you're supposed to be able to tell something about, um, about the triangle fire because you know you studied it and you're afraid you're gonna forget, just jot down a few bullet point notes. That way you can take the rest of the test um, without worrying about what you're gonna remember and what you're gonna forget. That's where you preview it entirely. Do I have an essay? How many short answers do I want? Are they, if I have a lot of multiple choice, circling that won't take as much of my writing time. I need to know how to budget my time. Read the directions after completing each section on the test. Don't wait till the end of the test. Read at the end of all the multiple choice. At the end of all the short answer, here's the number one thing that often happens with kids. The section on the short answer will often say, give the answer in complete sentences. Students start that with number one and two, and by number five and six, they're giving one or two word answers because they're focused on the answer instead of the directions. And so go 
back at the end of the answering all the short answer and reread those directions. Brainstorm and outline. Don't forget the brainstorming and outline with essays, just like you would on any essay. Don't just go right in and start writing because you're going to wind up writing a lot more than is necessary. And answer all questions and make them legible. Multiple choice, um, read them all and make, be, note any 100%, like every single one or never. Often that's kind of a trick question. We're gonna, I, I'm gonna actually show you this strategy about covering up the answer in the next slide. So I'll hold off on that one for a second. Note that many tests are structured so that two of them are similar. And one of these is usually one of the answers. So you can eliminate the other two, eliminate all unlikely. And if you have to guess, please don't leave it blank, at least guess wisely, never leave any blank. So let me show you that strategy about the multiple choice. So here's a, a question about um, Goldilocks and the three bears. And the three bears lived in a house in the, and without looking at the answers, every single student I've shown this to would say woods. So if I already know the answer, I'm gonna go ahead and do woods. Do not allow yourself to get confused with countryside. If it is woods up here, it will be woods down here. And often, like I said, there are two that are often quite common and similar. Do the one that you know is that is the correct answer. That doesn't work with all of them, but then you have to read each one of these word for word, do not skim. So looking at a matching test, read them carefully. And also note there are some tests that you're allowed to have the same answer more than once. Cross out, but don't obliterate because you might need to come back and correct one of them. Make sure those answers are legible. And don't, if you're not allowed to repeat, don't repeat. I've had tests return that have repeated answers. Match tough answers using process of elimination. Wait until the end, do the ones you know first. And choose, I'm gonna actually show you um, the actual strategy here of using the longest um, column first. So often this is how a test is given. And the shorter reading is on the left and the longer reading is on the right. And we start the test by we little bear and we read all of these over and over and over and over and over. Instead, look at A, the little girl found sleeping in the bear's house. Ooh, Goldilocks, I'll put an A here and I won't have to repeat reading this again. The bear with the porridge that was not too old or not too cold. I'm only gonna read that once, we little bear, B. So you actually reduce how much time it takes for you to do a matching test. True, false. Um, this really stumps a lot of students. All parts of the statements have to be true in order for the whole thing to be true. And look for these words that say always, never. Double negatives. I haven't seen them as much as before but you cross out the double negatives and then see if it's still true. If a statement appears true, see if you can prove it false. And I'm gonna show you one of them in just a second. And statements with reasons tend to be false because sometimes the reason is false. The statement might be true, but the reason might be false. Once again, both parts of it have to be true. So for example, Bears live in the woods. Since this does not say all bears live in the woods, I can say true because indeed bears live in the woods. Had this said all bears live in the woods, I can prove that wrong because polar bears do not live in the woods. So using the metacognition, what do I know that might make this false? Essay tests, read all the question before beginning, 
brainstorm. Don't let that brainstorming go away. Note how many points it is for the essay. And so how much valuable time do you want to use on it? Budget your timing. I can outline it, outline it. I so know so many students whose time was up and they were a third of the way through and half of what they wrote wasn't necessary, but they started going into a, a think trail and they just kept going on and on and on. That outline is so important to limit what you're writing about. And remember, they're looking for the knowledge of the subject, the organization of the ideas, and your writing skills. After the test, put it back. Reread the direction for each section, especially those ones with multi-steps or the ones that say, answer every question in complete sentences. Make sure every question has been answered. Ensure that all answers are, read, are readable, legible and cover the answers and see if you get the same answers the second time through if you have time to do that so <coughs> excuse me reflect on the test what went well what study strategy worked what study schedule worked is your study plan working do you have to modify that study plan is it was it the content that was difficult or was it the test format that was difficult understand what you did well, what you need help on, and what you need to change before taking the next test. Just like that one student added in that red comments, compile a list of questions for the teachers. Once she did that, her tests were all 85 and above. That was quick and dirty. A lot of information in there. Um, but I'm hoping that it was quite helpful information and ready for any questions that I can help you with or scenarios that you would like me to expand on. All right, um, so one of the questions, well, I wanna highlight something that you said that I think is really key because I didn't, I didn't recognize this when I was a student, that a study plan really includes both scheduling the time Mm -hmm. and also what actions I'm going to take during Absolutely. that time. And I, I just really appreciated you surfacing that. Yeah, because essentially that 30 minutes is effective 30 minutes if you know exactly what you're going to do during that 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the participants asked, is there a time of day that works best to study? And if it's more child specific, how can a student identify what their best time is? Um, it is both student specific and, and there it, it is, some of it is around other activities and I realize that that is a challenge, but essentially when possible, do it during the time that the student is most alert and less tired. Too many students do start um, after a football game and then come home and get a shower and they're fatigued if they can do it before practice or make that your day you can't study. For many students, it's immediately after school. And what I also talk to students about is don't wait till you're necessarily motivated to study. <laughs> There's a big difference between being motivated and being disciplined. I talk to my students all the time and I say, I'm motivated to cook. I love to cook, but I'm disciplined to make myself clean the dishes afterwards. And essentially that discipline becomes comforting and it isn't such a chore. And so essentially students are looking for, I'm just not motivated. Well, that's not what's expected. It's the discipline of doing it. So if you're disciplined to do it immediately after school or even break it up, I'm gonna do my first study session right after school, get, a, get dinner, come back and do my second study session after dinner and then have my free time. Even breaking it up that way, interleaving, kind of doing those chunks of studying versus an hour and a half of studying. Excellent. Um, 
how can I handle it if I have a, a math teacher who loves to give surprise quizzes? So in other words, I don't know that I have one coming up in a week and a half. I just, it could happen at any time. Yeah. Um, so what's my best approach to that on a nightly maybe basis? And this is one of those, and I welcome anyone to go back into either the link that you gave on the eight strategies for processing information or go to the Hill Center website and go to Community Ed Series, you can still get that. It's available to everyone. And this is where the study as you go method is so crucially important. Because when you get a new concept, let's say that you're looking in math and you've just learned the foil, where it's the first and the last and the inners and the outers. <laughs> and and I, I did that in the wrong order. And I apologize to all math teachers. I do know the right order for that. But anyway, so that night, look at a um, Khan, Khan, Khan Academy video of FOIL. Do a few extra practices. Then go come home and explain FOIL to your parent so that you then, as you go, are processing it so that those these um, last minute quizzes aren't as daunting because you are processing as you go. When there's new information, take one of those strategies to process it as you go. And then you're studying for the test as well. And those pop quizzes don't become so pop. Absolutely, yes. So I'm, I'm always ready. Um, do is there another version somebody asked are students still able to respond to quizlet if they've been on video remote instruction all day is quizlet going to be attractive still when all i've done is screen time all day then use flashcards absolutely use flashcards um it is a different slightly different modality it's not the big screen you can do it on your phone Sometimes Quizlet can be done. You can do Quizlet with friends, Quizlet Live, and do it with friends. Um, and so that's more engaging with it. But Quizlet is not your only flashcard. And that's where writing out your flashcards is a form of studying. And then you can line them up. And, or, and then you could put the answer on one flashcard and the, the topic, the word, or the question on another one. Can you do concentration and match them up? And on the back would be this one versus with matching with one, two matching with two. Quizlet is not the only flashcard memorization, concentration kind of thing. It's engaging for students before the pandemic and before we did so much online. Um, it is a different form. It does have more games and it does quiz you differently. Um, I wouldn't consider it, it, since it could be on a smaller device, I don't think it's as much concern. Essentially, what the student is willing to do is what should be um, permitted. Excellent. Um, another question, should you study older or more recent information first? Good question. Excellent question. So essentially with the idea that you study as you go, you've already on the first night, let's say that we are um, studying about rock formations and tonight and today we learned about sedentary rock. We're gonna go ahead and take that five or 10 minutes to just review it, look at the notes, write up the flashcards, look at a quick video, um, record what you learned into your own little webinar. So you've already done that. And so you have a series of these. And what you do is as you go, of uh, interleave in format, you put all those flashcards together, you practice them all one night. Then the next night you separate the cards and now you have two or three piles. Or you go into your, I know this immediately, I know it after thinking, I really don't know it and just do your I really don't know it cards tonight. So it doesn't matter if it's old information or new information. Essentially, it's the what do I remember information versus what don't I remember information. Yeah. So you want to budget your time on the things that you're not as familiar with to make sure you get it. 
Um, I started to, I jotted down that I really wanted to have you again surface the idea of creating and sharing podcasts. And I'm not sure that I'm going to go that route because somebody just asked the question, if a student has a couple of extracurriculars every day, what's the best strategy for daily study? And that was the first thing that popped into my head. So what, what's the best strategy if I'm, if I'm, you know, academically busy all day and then absolutely. I've got... And this is a huge challenge. And so what we do, because remember we want to study smarter instead of studying for an hour and a half in one night. Study as you go. And so most students do have that five or 10 minute chunk. When you're in the car, Encourage the student to bring the flashcards or on their phone do the Quizlet. Or if you're carpooling because you're going to the same soccer game and they're in the same, have the students question each other about it. Or um, looking at that. When it, if a student records a podcast of their information, and once again, when I do this presentation, think of it this way, just as if you were doing your own presentation, encouraging the students, teachers can even assign this as, an, as a homework assignment to record and their free recording devices are available, any app, they're ubiquitous, I don't recommend one over the other, free is fine. And essentially, go ahead and record a series of information about the different kinds of rock formations, and then listen to it as you're going to your events. Um, and then also encourage the student to talk about it. And one of the things that is really difficult is the lack of engagement between students at a certain age and parents, and I get that. But if they are able to even talk with a peer, um, then FaceTime a peer and say, what, do, what are you studying for in this chapter? Can I listen to your pod, can you, podcast? Can you share it with me? Because we're looking at shorter segments of time and it can be done in car rides. It can be done while students are waiting to be picked up. Students that learn the discipline, not the motivation, but the discipline to find these times, find up to, and we had one student that, that monitored the time that he was doing, and he had an hour and 10 minutes in 15 minute chunks that he never knew he had. That's excellent. Um, another question that popped up, do you have books that you would recommend that have more information? I think it's, it's kind of a wow, Geraldine, how did you learn all of this and where can I go get this amount of information as well? <laughs> okay. Um, any idea if this is adult directed or student directed or, I mean, I have an entire tub here I can pull out from. I think this is more a, a parent probably wanting to jump in and, and get a, the, the larger concept on all of this and to get as much background knowledge as possible. Um, there's one book called Smart But Scattered. There's both the for teens and for younger students. So there's two versions of this that kind of help give ideas for how to set up a work area, how to use that spare time, how to um, kind of manage everything. Another book by Mary D. Scalar. is 50 tips and the way that that is organized it is a tip per page so literally it's a hundred pages because it's a tip and then an explanation and so they're organized that way um, i am currently not not only reading studying word for word and rereading make it stick um, this is about interleaving studying and studying in chunks and studying as you go. And we had been doing this, and this really has been affirming for me and just really cemented exactly what studying as you go means. 
Somebody in the chat just backed you up on the Make It Stick book and, and said it's excellent. What about adult learners or kids on their way to college or in college? Is there a, is there EF for that for that level that that would be helpful to them? Um, there are a few. I'm sorry for kind of looking in here, but. Okay, for, let me just, because I, I don't, it's not like it's in there somewhere, but essentially see if the college, and colleges all have academic centers, and I know that they have available. There are college students who tutor. Take advantage of that. Meet with the tutor as frequently as you can. Go to the academic center because that'll provide the discipline to do it. Don't study in your in your dorm. Get a study buddy. Get into a spear, peer study group for each of the classes. Um, I had one student that I worked with um, and came back and talked, and I am middle school, but the student came back and I was just so, um, it was so heartwarming. He said he scheduled a weekly meeting with his, a 15 minute weekly check-in meeting with his professor every week. Just enough to make sure that too much time didn't pass before questions were answered. And he would keep an index card of all the questions that he had to make sure he didn't forget them. And he kept that, that index card in his wallet. I that was so heartwarming. That. That's always nice to hear. Always nice to hear that we're making a difference. Um, I want to um, I want to wrap up by talking about um, something that we have coming up on January 20th, because oftentimes students who need assistance with study skills and many other things also find themselves in situations where they feel anxious. You mentioned it tonight in terms of taking a test. There are some kids for whom that just produces anxiety, even if they are well prepared. Mm -hmm. um, so on January 20th at seven o'clock, um, so this same time frame, our own counseling department is, is um, doing another free community ed series event. Um, and we're calling it working together to help anxious students. So we'll, we'll learn how to understand anxiety as well as share specific strategies to help alleviate it. So um, please do tune back in on January 20th for that if, if you have time. And um, I know tomorrow we'll be sending out a really in-depth follow-up email as this is the last in our executive functioning CES series. So um, the in-depth email will have things like links to slides, links to the videos of this, as well as the past presentations. Um, and we are, we are always here to help. So please don't hesitate to reach out if we, can, if we can be of help here at the Hill Learning Center. Thank you all so much for being a part of this, Geraldine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's I always- it's so valuable to get your expertise. And I, I find myself doing the same thing that a lot of folks in the chat are saying, and they just, I wanna crawl inside your brain and be able to get all of the information that you have. So thank you for sharing that with us and everything that you do for students as well as parents. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and take good care.